You're raised as an athlete to fight back. So why all of a sudden when you retire, do you stop the good fight? This is Finding Center with Nick Hardwick. But I don't know how you felt when you played. Like, to me, that was the fun part. Like, yeah, like, yeah I want to I figure out how to block this guy and move him, you know. And so I was always trying to dream up ways to beat because I wasn't going to beat him by just hitting him and chopping my feet. That wasn't going to happen, right? Yeah. So coaches can make me chop down a board as much as they want. That shit ain't going to work. Hey guys, it's Nick. Hope everyone out there is doing well today. Thank you so much for the time that you've been given the Finding Center podcast. We hope to be giving you some critical information and perhaps inspiration to use on your journey towards health. If you have any recommendations at all or topics or people that you would like us to cover or interview, please DM me at Nick Hardwick or at Finding Center Podcast and I will do my best to get back to you. Any questions as well, I love hearing from you guys. You know, as far as health goes, here's a game I like to play. I like to think about my life in reverse. When I'm in my 80s, 90s, and even into my 100s, that's right, I said it, I'd love to be 100 years old, but only if I can do it with health. I want to be able to look back and know that I did everything possible to stave off neurocognitive decline. I want no regrets. As Dr. David Hazy said on one episode, the difference between being old and being an elder is retaining your wisdom. If we allow ourselves to slip physically, mentally, we are going to struggle as well. And with mental decline, we lose the essence of the person and all of that accumulated wisdom. What a shame. Dr. David Hazy says we should rage against that. I totally agree. If you're new here, the Hardwick family, we've announced a new supplement line with our name on it. It's called Hardwick.life. It's like Hardwick.com, but instead of .com, it's .life. My family has been taking these exact pharmaceutical-grade supplements for several years now. We love what they have provided us. Our philosophy is to do everything within our power today to ensure that we're giving ourselves the best chance possible of living a fulfilling life. Hardwick.life is centered around taking care of the fundamentals of health through an active lifestyle, getting proper nutrition and supplementation to boost our immunity and protection for the areas in our lives that need special attention. My goal is to restore brain health for a lifetime of running into other giant humans over 30,000 times. That's right, 30,000 head hits. That, as well as looking after my heart, which also I'm sure came under some damage being big and then getting small. And I also have a family history of heart disease. Those are vital for me. Jamie's concern is her immunity and her gut health. That's why she loves the foundation life and gut life. Whatever areas of need or concern you have, Hardwick.life has you covered. Be sure to subscribe for 15% off and free shipping. When you do that, you're going to also get access to our simple family-friendly recipes to help get you started or keep you on track with your health journey. We are Hardwick.life, foundational elements for a fulfilled life. Check us out. Also, guys, you know this. If you follow my stories on Instagram, at Nick Hardwick, then you already know I post almost every meal that I eat. I do it to show that health and maintaining a fit and active body and lifestyle, it's no trick, guys. It's consistency, consistently making good choices. One thing I've put into my body consistently since the company was founded in 2017 is Bub's Naturals Collagen Protein and MCT Oil Powder. One way or another, I have used Bub's religiously, daily. I swear by it. These days, since talking to Doc Amon, I have cut out coffee, but I still put the bubs in a protein hot chocolate that has been giving me my morning fix. I love it. It makes it creamier. You're going to love it too. As I know lots of you have taken me up on the recommendation. Jamie swears by it. She has a bit multiple times every single day. No other collagen brand can claim to be 100% NSF certified and donate 10% to charity. That is awesome. If you're in the San Diego area, Bub's products are now available at all Barron's markets. Stop in and pick some up today and see how conveniently health can fit into your life. If you don't have a Barron's near you or don't want to go to the store right now, I get it. Order it online at bubsnaturals.com. That's bubsnaturals.com. Use the code HARDWICK20 for 20% off that order at bubsnaturals.com. 
All right, joining us today on the Lessons from Legends segment of the Finding Center podcast is Olin Krutz. Olin is a guy that was a creative technician, innovator at the center position, was fiercely competitive and tough as hell. And I have no problem admitting I stole plenty of techniques from Krutzy during my time in the league. He was on the smaller side, quick, great first step unbelievable hands and really rowdy he led the bears offensive line for 13 seasons after they drafted drafted him with the 64th pick in the third round of the 98 draft out of university of washington where he was a consensus all-american he started 187 games in his nfl career that spanned 14 years he's a six-time pro bowler a one-time first team all pro a one-time second team all pro whoo And now, aside from being the father of six, he co-hosts the Chicago Bears pregame on AM670 to score, and you can catch him on their postgame at NBC Sports Chicago. Follow him on Instagram, at Olin Krutz, and at Olin underscore Krutz on Twitter. Welcome in, Olin Krutz. Olin, thank you for the time today. How are you, brother? I'm good, Nick, man. Thanks for having me. So, I understand now you've got six kids, four girls, two boys. What ages are they all? Uh, my two boys are 17 and 15, and actually my oldest boy, uh, he's going to be a center next year, so that's fun for me. Uh, he's a lineman. My younger boy, uh, he's a linebacker, safety type, and he loves football. So uh, like you probably know and all parents know, you can't force them. So when they do love football and wrestling, you're, you're lucky as a dad. So uh, they ended up liking the two sports that I love, and, and it's been fun. My daughters are 13, 10 eight and four and they run the house so of course um, yeah yeah the, uh, <laughs> my younger girls when I tell them like they're like dad what did you used to do I said I played for the Bears they they look at their mom like did you hear what he said that guy's crazy he think he actually played for the Bears so uh, it's fun man it's a crazy house we have and actually we have a just to top it all off during this quarantine we went and got ourselves a brand new puppy just so there's no sleep in the house so oh nice uh, <laughs> yeah, what kind nice. of puppy so, did you get uh he's a uh, let me see if I can get this right. He's a, a Bernie Doodle, so a Bernie's Mountain Dog, oh yeah, and half poodle, and um, he we took him. He 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 likes to bite and have fun and wake everybody up. So he, he's keeping us on our toes during this quarantine time. Oh god, that's fantastic. So studying up on you a little bit, I did figure out you were a wrestler at St. Louis High School out in Honolulu. Also, obviously, a very good football player. You said your older boys are into football, which is great. Are you coaching football? I don't coach football. I coach them in Little League. Um, yep. I coach their um, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade team. So I did that about, for about six years and loved it. Loved that level. Um, I'd like to coach at some point again. It's just um, I'm a, I don't want to coach them and, and kind of you have boys. Yeah. It's kind of like yeah. you got to let them be themselves after a while. So, uh, But I, I do have a private gym that, that I go to, and they train there. Obviously, now it's quarantine. They're there all the time training with me. So uh, we do a lot of uh, weight work, and we do a lot of technique work there. Oh, that's fantastic. When did you figure out that they love football? When they were young, they were really into it, and you could just kind of see, like, that was their dream. Right? That's what they wanted to do, right? So uh, it's even easy to coach them and kind of be hard on them through that way because at some point you're kind of like, all right, I, you know, I'm going to – tell you how to be good, but it's not easy. So I'm going to be yes. hard on you all the time and make sure this is what you want to do because uh, this is what, like you, Nick, probably like, this is what we love. Like yeah. my dad's probably a little overbearing when it comes to football <laughs> and how I want it done. And just, you know, you just teach them the, the, the traits that you care about. Like I always tell my older boy, like if you're not picking your teammate up or the running back up, that's all I care about. Like if you're running down there, taking them off the ground, uh, uh, hustling down the field, that's, when I'm watching a football game, like, that's what I'm looking for. I could care less. We all miss blocks. Like, that's going to happen. Yeah. But if you're giving effort and you're helping your teammates up and supporting guys and doing all the things that football is really about, then I'm good with, with whatever you do out there. Yeah, you're talking about the small things, the effort and the leadership that when you get those things down, then everything else kind of falls into line with it. Right. The, the, the character that football builds, right? And, and yeah. I found, like, when I started coaching, I found like you didn't have to have to coach toughness. You didn't have to coach effort because the game just demanded it. So I found that if, if, if we just, I should tell the coaches in little league, like just teach the game. You don't have to scream at them. It's going to be hard. Like, it's, like the game is hard no matter what you do. It's a hard game. So they'll get that from the game. So the game, like it's funny, Nick, like the farther I've gotten away from it, the more I've, I've even fallen more in love with football. I just think it's a great game. I think kids get so much from it. And I understand 
all the stuff that goes on with the concussions and all those things. And I went through that through coaching little league and trying to make it safer and, and try to educate people on how to make it safer, but just really, really, really fell in love with the game of football again and what it actually teaches kids. What are your girls into? Uh, my girls play everything at that age, right? And it's volleyball, it's basketball, it's gymnastics. And, and I, I hate to tell you that I did end up, my daughter came to me and she said, dad, it, we don't have a coach for our 12, 13 year old basketball team. And if we don't have a coach, we don't have a season. So I, she was asking me to coach the basketball team. So I did. And that was the most humbling experience <laughs> I've ever had in my life. Okay. Cause the girls don't give care what you're saying to them. So uh, we weren't very good, and, and a lot of that was my fault because I didn't know how the hell to coach basketball, but uh, we had fun and, and just learned a lot. But they're into that stuff. But um, girls' sports is interesting nowadays. I don't know if you know much about it, but a lot of it is club. Uh, yeah. A lot of it is a lot of hours, a lot of time, and I don't think we have time on this podcast for <laughs> me to give you my exact feelings on how I feel about where all that club sports and all that stuff is going. It's and, and crazy. I'm not really happy. Yeah, I'm not really happy with it. Uh, not really happy with the hours they demand and you got to have an Adidas ball to walk in the gym. You got to have Adidas clothes on. And my question is where, where the hell is all this money going? So um, I hope some, at some point, somehow girls sports start to change back to where they're just playing for their high schools and they're just playing little league and they're playing all the sports they need to play. So as I've listened to you talk about raising the family, I've brought, I'm bringing my family up with three tenants. You got to be tough. You have to be hardworking and you have to be respectful. And I think those three things will carry over into everything, whatever you want to do, whether it's a football player, any other type of athletics, just being a regular human. If you're tough, you're hardworking and respectful. It's you set yourself up for success. If you were to say, these are our tenants that I'm raising the Crudes family on, what would they be? Yeah, it's just really strong character. And it's funny when you use the word tough nowadays, people kind of, they don't like that word anymore, yeah, right? But, right? But the way you're saying it, Nick, it, like people don't understand is like, that's not the way you mean it. I don't mean tough by like beating people up or, right. yeah, I mean like be tough in a sense that you're going to get up in the morning and do your homework when you don't want to. Like that's being tough. That's you know, it. Uh, read that book. Uh, I was just telling one of my daughters, you have to read the book. And she's like, I don't want to. And I said, well, that's why you have to read it. It's because you don't want to do it. And like that's that. the kind of toughness you're, you're, you're trying to build in them. And just, you know, I'm, I'm from Hawaii. Family's very important. Being close, having each other's back is the things I was taught growing up. And, and being respectful, like you said, of people and everything around them. And just, just I just want to see, I always tell people, I want to sit down with my kids later in life and want to have a beer with them. Look, I don't, yes. I don't, I don't want to not be around them. You know what I mean? And for me, sometimes... It's a little weird because um, the culture I grew up with, they're growing up in Illinois. So it's, yes. it's, it's, it's a little different and the Hawaiian culture is a little different than Illinois culture. So just try to instill everything that you want out of them, but still let them be themselves. Yeah, I was going to ask how challenging is that? Because you're talking about two completely different cultures. Do you guys get back it to is, Hawaii to dip sorry, in there? Bro. No, go ahead. Go ahead. We, 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 haven't, we haven't been there uh, maybe three years maybe three years now, I went back. Remember Dominic Raiola? Yes. Uh, oh, he's yeah. my best friend I grew up with in, in Hawaii. And he went into the Polynesian uh, Football Hall of Fame this year. So I went nice. back for that. It's the first time I went back in three years just because kids sports and we've just been busy. And then, of course, this year when we plan to go back for the first time to see everybody, this quarantine is hit. So we're kind of waiting that out, right? Of but course. it is. It's a different culture. But there's a lot of a lot of good here and a lot of good people here too. And, and, and people who believe in the same stuff. So um, just kind of, and I've been here almost 20 years now. So just kind of learning a, a new culture and, and getting used to it and, and kind of integrating ourselves into this community has, has been a good learning experience also. Oh, and when you think back to your football career and all the success that you've had up till now in raising a beautiful family, what's your strength that's allowed all that success. If you were to boil it down to, I don't know, one or two things, what would it be? I, I think the one thing that, that I can give myself credit for, and probably like any center that you interview on, this, the hardest thing is talking about yourself, right? Like that's we're not right, like yeah. that. We're all linemen and we don't like to do that stuff, but uh, it's probably persistence. I, 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 if I see something, I just figure I'm gonna do it the right way. I'm gonna stay on that track. And eventually for me, it usually takes longer than I'd like, but I just stay there and I do the right things. And I'd be as persistent as I can be. And I just work at it. And I take the things that I've learned from football as far as studying 
as far as doing things right, as far as always doing stuff for the team, trying to make other people better. And that usually equates success for me. So I, I think back to when it all kind of switched in my head for me, and it was really high school wrestling. I was a super mediocre sophomore on the varsity team. I was 19 and 20, and then something switched in my head, and I ended up becoming 48 and 2. And then my senior year, I got second in the state of Indiana. And I remember everything kind of switched then for me. It was all about the discipline, the dedication, the desire, and just becoming what you wanted to be. When did, when did that light bulb switch off for you or switch it was on? Prob- it, the, the, it, I kind of went through high school and things, and um, I, was, I was 290 my junior year in high school, right? And wow. I would lose weight to wrestle 275. So I was kind of the same weight I was from my junior year in high school all the way through my NFL career. So I don't want to say things were easy for me, but they, they kind of were. I, I, I could win wrestling matches without a lot of technique. I could block people without a lot of technique. And uh, the one moment that always stands out to me, um, it was my, my junior year at Washington. And I was, people were saying to me, I was the best center in the nation. And I was, I went in there to my season. And all I thought about was the NFL. Cause before that it was just a dream, right? Like people would say that to you and be like, I'm not making it to NFL. I'm, a, I'm from a family of chicken fighters in Hawaii. Like, what kind of, like, it's either, it was either football or chicken fights for me, right? So anyway, um, I, I had a, my first two games, Nick, were terrible. I, I was horrible on the field. And I went to see my O-line coach, uh, Steve Morton at Washington at the time. And he said, he said the words to me, he said, Olin, like, make it about the team and everything else falls into place. And for me, that was kind of a light bulb moment where it wasn't yeah. just about, like if, I, like, if I wanted to do good at things, you can't make it about yourself. And and when you make it about the team, it's everything me and you are talking about. When it's about the team, it's about doing things right. It's about discipline. It's about working hard. It's about just doing your job. It's about, you know, giving effort on every play because you don't want to let the guy next to you down. So uh, that was kind of, you asked me, it was one moment that equated the success I had in the NFL. It was that because, you know, I I also had problems at Washington, same kind of problems I had at uh, Chicago where I got in trouble for fighting and things like that. So, um, that that moment for me was kind of a, like a light bulb moment. It's funny you mentioned when you were at Washington or when you were 290 pounds in high school, your junior year, you didn't need any technique really to beat people. You could just probably overwhelm them physically. But then notably, you became a masterful technician who I think really was part of a movement that changed the game, especially at the center position. I, I used to study you and I used to, find the the smallest little details of your game that I could pick off and rip and make my own with, with my body style and the way that I played, when did it switch? When did it occur to you that I've got to really hammer down these techniques? (laughs) Mike, Mike Wells. I don't know if you know the name Mike Wells. He's a nose guard for the bears. So when I, when I was playing at Washington or at St. Louis, I would just jump turn and throw guys, right? Like, jump roll them and then run downfield and cut guys. And I just, would ha- I was having a blast out of the field. And actually my wife's brother was my old line coach at, wa- at, at St. Louis high school. And he taught me this stab where I'd stab guys in the neck and their hip. And, and Nick, it was so ugly. I was just bending guys. <laughs> and anyway, uh, so it was I was like a choke slam. That. Yeah, it was a choke. So I would like, I got to find film for you. I would like choke slam guys at Washington, at like at Washington college, like choke slam, hook them, <laughs> choke slam, pass throw. It was just, anyway. So I got to the NFL, and Mike Wells, probably like a 550-pound bencher, he played a nose guard for us, pretty good football player. Not, not pretty good, really good. And I went in the first 907 to jump turn him. And Mike picked me up. I mean, I was off my feet. And he ran me, and I, you know what, one of those where you tackle the running back? Yes. And I tackled her, and he slammed me on my back, okay? <laughs> I'm eight yards in the backfield. I think um, at that time it was Edgar Bennett's on the ground, right? Eric Kramer staring at me like, what the hell? Uh, uh, and Tony Wise, the old line coach at the time, runs up and yep. he's like, Cruz, that's the block you were drafted for. And I was looking up and I was like, gosh, I don't think I can ever make that block. Like, that, that, that's insane. <laughs> so uh, a long story, uh, long story, but where I'm getting to is I had to change my game. Like I knew that wasn't going to work. Yep. And I turned, on, I turned on some Tom Malin film and watched the way he ran angles at guys. I watched some Dermani Dawson, which you couldn't watch a lot of Dermani because he was so athletically gifted yeah. that the things he did were just 
I remember Tony Wise said, "Only uh, I want you to watch this guy play." And I watched two plays, and I gave it back to him. I said, "I can't do that." That guy, that guy's reaching a three technique on a G play while Fanica's pulling. That's insanity to me. But um, so I watched a lot of those guys. Casey Wigman now yeah. was the center in front of me. That's when right. I, when I got to Chicago, I learned a lot about studying from him. I learned a lot of different techniques from him. So and just kind of evolved into and and I've always been enamored by martial arts and I do I've done some and kind of worked at stuff like that so kind of just evolved met Tunch Ilkin talked to Tunch about pass blocking technique and hand fighting techniques and and then I, I remember um this karate guy came to help with the D lineman at the Bears and I was talking to him was he a Viking he said, at one point he was like a charger and a Viking I think I've run into oh, that guy Tunch, a few you mean times. you mean uh, Tunch Ilkin no 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 the uh, uh, karate guy no the this defensive guy was like line, a, the karate guy no, he was like a legitimate karate guy. Okay. Like, I don't know. I don't mean, I, I wish I knew who he was because he was the guy who made me put my hand out, like out in front of the ball. Because he said, why right. would you waste? You to, yeah. Yeah. So he said, why would you waste your time with your hand all the way back here when if you could put it out here, you can get your hand on a guy immediately. And I thought, oh, and I, so I, that's where I changed. I think it was on my, I would have to go back and look at film, but I think you should have it on my leg or kind of tucked in. And that's when I put it way out in front of me, which got where, you know, my fingers started moving and they made the rule where I couldn't move my hand and all right. that kind of stuff. But um, so just always develop techniques. Like, you know, um, these guys are monsters, man. I mean, yeah. gosh, the guy, Pat Williams. I mean, gosh, what a monster he was for the oh. Vikings and just. But, Chris but, Jenkins. But Chris Jenkins, uh, uh, Gilbert Brown, Sean oh, Rogers, Casey Hampton. I mean, these guys, uh, the guy in San Diego, what was his Jamal name? Williams. Jamal Williams. Gosh, man, come on. That yeah. guy was, but, but, but I don't know how you felt when you played. Like, to me, that was the fun part. Like, yeah, like, yeah I want to, I want to figure out how to block this guy and move him, you know? And so I was always trying to dream of ways to beat because I wasn't going to beat him by just hitting him and chopping my feet. That wasn't going to happen. Right. Yeah. So coaches can make me chop down a board as much as they want. That shit ain't going to work. So I was trying to always figure out an angle, man. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that's the truth, isn't it? It's like, sure, I'll do this dog and pony show, whatever you want. But when it gets to the game and you're asking me to move a 400-pound Ted Washington, who when, when you Ted. turn the film on, oh, I mean, think about, when, think about when you would turn the film on with Ted in front of you, you couldn't even see you. It was like there's four <laughs> offensive linemen, a tight end, and no center. Who's snapping the ball here? It was <laughs> Washington's ass. Do you know what Ted was? Um, when I played Buffalo in 2001 or two, Ted's backup was Pat Williams. Oh, goodness. So Ted would leave, and Pat would come in. That was the <laughs> longest game. That was the longest game I ever had in my life, man. Oh, my God. It was something. I, I used to have Ted Williams because he became a Raider. And then for two games a year, he was the guy. And it was right. just basically what we did because you couldn't zone through him or anything. We just soloed me up. And then we'd have the guards shoot up to the linebackers. Try and they, would just, space, they right? would just go and I would be dancing with the big bear. That was, that was well, it. Well, what people didn't realize about Ted was how he was – because he was our team. He was my teammate here for two years, I think it was, two yeah. or three years. He was such a smart football player. He understood like personnel and formations, and well, you know, in my opinion, the best, the best run nose guard ever to play in the league. So, oh my god, uh, that's just my humble opinion. He was something else, man. Who was the best guy you faced? The guy that when you when you had him on the schedule, it was up and coming. Some anxiety set in. Mine was Richard Seymour because he ended up being with New England. We were playing oh, him a bunch good, out there man. at the beginning of my career, mm -hmm. and then Belichick traded him to Oakland. And that guy was a handful because he was smart. He was long. He was strong. He was athletic. And he was an asshole. Yeah. Yeah. He put yeah, me on my back things. one time. Yeah. He was, he was very good. He was but good. Uh, probably Pat Williams. Probably Pat yeah. Williams because he was in the north with us in Minnesota. That's and, right. Uh, just, just I, knew, I knew if I came out of that day and won 51%, it was a good day. You know, yeah. like you're just trying to break even. If I could just break even today. Uh, or just get a stalemate at some point and, and not let him, uh, you know, push me back and cause a fumble or mess up one of my snaps because he was so tight on you all the time. And yep. just very good with his hands. He had very fast feet. And there's a reason wherever he went, they were the number one run defense in the league. Yeah. Yeah. And he also had that little swim move that he would hit. So you would lean on him because he was so big and then he would swim you and then leave you 
on all fours sitting in the grass. I mean, he was <laughs> – For sure. I don't know just, how he made plays off that angle. Like, he plays so tight in this angle yeah. and still get out and make the play on the other side. It was crazy. Yeah. Man. He was yeah, good. Don't, they, don't make, they don't make nose guards like they used to. I mean, the, yeah, the I don't, big I don't guys, know, the Sam Adams, the Jenkins, the Pat Williams, the Gilbert, they don't make those guys – the league so much smaller and faster and pass oriented now that it doesn't really do you any good to have one of those guys. Yeah. We have one here who kind of reminds me of Akeem Hicks kind of reminds me oh, of those yeah. guys where he's just a big, strong, like he, that, like that you're saying, like oh, that kind of athlete, right? That kind of guy on yeah. the nose and just wrecking havoc on you, man. Yeah. He's got those big clubs arms. So you were all pro first team, all pro, which is like the MVP of centers in 2006. <laughs> that was also the year you went to, Went to the Super Bowl. What what year do you think you peaked? Was that your peak year? No, that was the year I think that we you know we uh, we went to Super Bowl. The team yeah. was the best that I played on. We I played on some really bad teams early on, especially off well offense. We were never really great in Chicago, but um, I probably probably played my best football two thousand and one through two thousand and four maybe because two thousand and six, which is the year I'm probably most known for. That was the, my 10th year in the league, you know, yeah. so I was older already. So um, it was probably when I, like, you know, it's like your fourth or fifth year where you're still healthy, the game kind of slowed down yeah. for you and you're kind of playing, you know, it's almost, the NFL is never easy, but it's almost easy. It's like, yeah. I, I can do this. You know, you're probably having a couple more whoppers and beers than you should because it's just, it's just a lot, you know, probably camp probably a little more beers than you should be having because the game seems to slow down for you at that moment. So yeah. I would say that's probably when I peak. Yeah. And you're at your peak strength, athleticism, your quickness is there. The game slowed down. Everything just kind of comes into it. I tell you though, around that 2004, and I don't know what year it stopped, but through the Super Bowl there, those bears teams were pretty damn awesome. I mean, you had some, you had some strong personalities, you Erlacher, Briggs, who led that, who led those teams? Probably Lack, Lack led yeah. it, and you know, and he's he's a he's a first ballot Hall of Famer, right? And, and yeah. you kind of get that like when you're playing with guys, and you're like, man, this guy is good, and, and then it, then he goes in the Hall of Fame, and you're like, yeah, he was good. And then there's Hester, right? And Hester was, That's I right. mean, he was so fun to be on the field with. I mean, that guy every time he caught a punt in the middle of the field, it was crazy. But that defense was just, I mean, you know, Briggs and Tom, and Tommy Harris and Mike Brown and Peanut Tillman and Vasher. Otto Wally Agunli, and then when Otto Wally left, it was Julius Peppers and Alex. I mean, uh, uh, nine on seven was just brutal. You know what I mean? The practice yeah. was – they just destroyed us in practice. You know, uh, <laughs> I, I'd get so – I was like a little crybaby half the time. You know, we were getting beat up all practice by these guys. They looked like they were having so much fun. You know what I mean? Like, gosh, I wish I could have played with those kind of guys, you know. But, um, yeah, we, we had a lot of fun. They, and not only that, but Lack was – not only Lack was a good leader – uh, he was just a great guy, a great teammate. Uh, uh, you couldn't ask for a better superstar than that guy. Like, we used to come in on Saturdays when you would do walkthrough, and we'd always end our walkthrough with dodgeball, right? So, Lack wanted to play dodgeball, offense versus defense, and we always nice. had games going on. And that was his personality. Like, he just wanted to have fun. He was – and such a fierce competitor, too. I, I remember there was a preseason game, I think, we came out there, and – First off, you you pull up into the captain's huddle, and he's like, he's giant for a middle linebacker. He's all a <laughs> right. six five. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute, what position are you playing again? I mean, obviously, I knew who it was, but I I was looking up at him, and I was like, Jesus Christ, yeah. who is this guy? He's a giant. Yeah. And then, of course, like coin toss, boom, take your sides, whoever is kicking, whoever is receiving. And then normally, it's like, hey, shake your hands, good luck, stay healthy. It's the preseason, right? I look at Brian. I wanted to shake his hand. He's like, fuck you, pussy. I was like, <laughs> Jesus. It's like, all right then, let's get it. Like, all right then. But I mean, That's just. It, man. But but I loved it, and right then yeah. I was like, I love this guy. He's just such a yeah. fierce competitor. I mean, he's just even in the preseason, he's like, let me show you how this is done here. I I, I greatly appreciated it. Yeah, for him, the fight was fun, right? Like that's what he was there for. He just yeah. enjoyed. I mean, he would run around, kick your ass, and the smile would never leave his face. That that was so irritating. Like I was always trying to knock the smile off his face. Like I knock the smile off his face, like I blocked it, you know. But, oh my god, which is very rare. He was. I remember we had Barry Minner and Mike. Barry Minner is an older older name in Chicago. And they had uh, Lack on the line playing Sam in the under defense. Oh, yeah. His rookie year. 
And Barry Minner goes down and Lack was terrible on the line of scrimmage because he was safety in college, right? So he's really struggling that year. And Barry Minner is going to miss a game. And they put Lack in middle linebacker. So I went out. We had outside zone called. And those days, I'm not saying I was great, but I could jump out and cut off the middle linebacker, oh, yeah. right? I'm like, if they gave me a wide three, I'm like, I'm like, this rookie is done. Nick, he took off. I've never seen speed like that in my life when he ran. I, I didn't even get close to him. You know what I mean? He gave me one of these, and he went, and I was like, holy shit, who the hell? I went to um, – how do I tell Big Cat and Chris Valero? I go, that, that guy is going to be good. And they're like, he's a wimp. <laughs> he's going to be no good. He can't play on the line of scrimmage and not. And he ended up being – like, that was the moment. I, I don't know what he did in that game. I can't remember that far back. But that was the moment I was like, this guy, he's going to be something. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. Cause several times we played you guys, I don't remember ever touching him. It was always like, it, it's just so sideline to sideline. And then watching yeah. the film, I mean, it was just crazy because it was Erlacher and Briggs and they were like synchronized Briggs. swimmers, but just, yeah, he they, was would, so they good. would, they would, Oh God, he was so good and so underrated, but they would just tackle guys together and then slide over the top of them and then pop up both simultaneously. It's like synchronized. It's like, <laughs> yeah. Holy crap. They had, so much, a... they had so much fun, but the problem was they had so much fun kicking your ass. You know what I mean? So you're yeah. like, you, you, halfway during camp, I'm like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut one of these guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable, man. Oh. Uh, best moment of your career? Uh, the NFC Championship game in that year, yeah. 2006. Uh, beating the Saints at Soldier Field. Uh, the snow was coming down. Uh, Mrs. McCassie gets her father's trophy. There's so much history in Chicago, right? It's just, yeah. uh, you don't realize how lucky you are to play here. Uh, and I know that's, everybody says that, but it's so true, man. Like, when you win something like that in this city and you get to be a part of a moment when basically the guy who started the NFL's daughter's on the stage accepting his trophy, and you kind of feel like you had something to do with that. Like, that is, a, if you love football, that's an awesome moment. Yeah, that's about as good as it gets. Most humbling yeah. moment? Uh, probably losing that Super Bowl. That, that, yeah. that was a humbling moment. You know, um, and, and it hurt for you, but it, but it more hurts for, like, uh, you think, like, Lovey Smith deserves a Super Bowl. Brian Erlacher deserves a Super Bowl. Yeah. Devin Hester. You know, just Ruben Brown was my team, and Ruben Brown's a hell of an offensive lineman. Uh, one of the best guards to ever play the game. You, guys like that, and you're just sitting in a locker room after, and you're, um, you're just humbled by, you know, like, gosh, it's so hard to get here. Will we ever come back? And the answer was no. What was it like trying to come back from that? Trying to, trying to regroup. And I obviously never got to play in one. I got to play in the AFC championship game, got beat by the Patriots when they ended up, they had an undefeated season going and they ended up losing to the Giants in the Super Bowl. But I just felt like putting your heart back on the chopping block after you just got it stomped. That's if, if, I were to have lost the Super Bowl, I guess that's maybe what I would think it felt like. Like yeah, put it, yourself it, out there again. Yeah. And, and you never really get over it. I mean, you kind of, you get over it, but you never get, it always kind of stings when you talk about it, right? So uh, it's hard to come back from as a team just because I think naturally you don't want to lose a Super Bowl and no one wants it to be their fault. So finger pointing starts naturally in a locker room yeah. and, uh, it's hard to pack in that cohesiveness you had going into that week. Uh, it kind of breaks a little bit. And then, then you know, like uh, we traded Thomas Jones and some of your key guys are gone. It's not the same team. And there's just always things that are going on. For me, it was weird, uh, Nick, because it's kind of when my body started to go downhill a little bit, right? And it's funny that I'm talking to you about this because I'll never forget this. I started to do, uh, do a lot more. I don't know if you ever heard of Greg Cook. He runs a functional movement system. I, I started to do a lot Greg. more like bands at- and, yeah, yeah, I started like bands and chops and stuff like that, right? And I got away from strength training, and not because I wanted this, because my body, I couldn't, my elbows were kind of bad. Yeah. So I came out, and we were playing you guys to open the season in 2007. We were playing the Chargers. That's right. And I went to hit Jamal Williams, and I had perfect, like the angle I wanted. I had everything I wanted, and he didn't move an inch. <laughs> and I thought, man, I am in trouble. Oh. Yeah, not a good feeling there with Jamal. I've, I've been in plenty of those situations. I tell you, going against him, coming in as a rookie every year, facing Jamal at practice, I, I ended up getting another ulcer. I had one in college, and then it came back up 
I threw up before every single practice. <laughs> and my coach monster, is like, man. my coach said, I'm going to have to send you to the head doctor if you don't get this thing figured out. I said, well, just give me some Prila a second. Maybe we'll be all right. <laughs> it's like, I'll just throw it up. It'll be a, it's no big deal there. When did you know it was time to leave? Um, well, for me, like I left New Orleans uh, halfway through that year and um, really documented now more than ever, but just uh, could not get along with the O-line coach, Aaron Cromer, who's in uh, Los Angeles now. And I don't like to get into the story because um, it's just kind of far away. And sure. We just didn't get along, you know, and it just uh, never really meshed and, and really felt like one more day in that, in that building, in my head, uh, one more thing he would have said, I probably would have. I mean, I probably would have hit him. So I felt like for myself, it was just best to remove myself and get out of there. But honestly, when I did leave, I was kind of like, what the hell was I doing? You know what I mean? Like I was just, it was kind of just, you're just putting band-aids on every, I remember uh, Jari Evans and Carl Nix and Jermar Bush, I were like, oh, do you not tape anything? And I was like, the next thing that gets hurt, it's over for me anyway. So no, I don't, I don't tape nothing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they couldn't believe like, I had no ankle tape on, no wrist, I had no tape on anything. And I was like, it doesn't even help anymore. So I might as well not, like I'm not taping anything anymore, but, but probably like you and all the guys who love football, like just, I was just so in love with the game, right? Just so in yeah. love with the competition and, and more, I think you missed the mental aspect like you talked about of actually trying to figure out how to beat somebody uh, what what to do to, to to get an edge on a guy? So um, I, I I can't really tell you when I figured it was over because I left for like a different reason. Yeah. But when I left, I realized it was probably over. Any regrets? No, not really, man. I, the, yeah. the NFL was so good to me. You know, I, yeah, I re- right. obviously you regret not winning the Super Bowl, uh, but I feel like, and I didn't do things right all the time, but I feel like I worked hard. I feel like I gave, when I played, I gave everything I had, you know, so I, I, I don't really have very much. I think one regret I do have is um, I should have, I should have, I should have took the Bears offer and came back to finish, just finish my career here, maybe set the record for most starts as a Chicago Bear, kind of let pride get in the way of, with the general manager and talk, like, you know, sometimes I, I tell young guys now, I'm like, tell your agent you don't want to know what the general manager says. You just want to know the offer. There you go. You don't want to know what he says about you. You don't, I said, he has to say bad things about you. You know, so I think that I, I let it get too personal. And I thought maybe Jerry Angelo, who was a GM at the time, who's a great guy. I don't, I don't hold no ill will to him. Um, I let it get too personal between me and him. And you have to realize like, they're not really the Chicago bears. The players are, and you just come back and, and you know, they made me a good offer. Nick, they made me a great offer at the time at my age. I just let a few things in the process get in my way. Sure. That would be, if, if you ask me what's the one regret I have, I wish I would have finished my career here. How well did you handle it? When you, when you actually said, I'm done in New Orleans, how well did you handle leaving the game? And when do you feel like you settled into regular human life, I guess? Uh, it's not easy, right? It's, it, like everybody finds out when you walk away, like, gosh, man, this, this is a real adjustment that you mean I can't just – tell the guy behind me at Starbucks go fuck himself. That doesn't work out <laughs> well. Huh? So, so, you know, you miss that interaction, right? The interact, like the locker room is just, you just say whatever you want. There's rarely, rarely anybody says any statement is racist. Nothing is, nothing is really awful. Right. So you just kind of speak. So you met for sure. But uh, first couple of years, I think it wasn't easy. It was, it was just trying to figure out what are you going to do next? And I didn't, I didn't, I don't have a degree. I don't have a plan in place to what I wanted to do. So for me, it was, a, it was a little bit of a finding myself. I always thought I'd just stay in football, but then realized with my kids, I wouldn't have time to be home. So now what else do I do, right? And I got a few offers to coach right when I was done, turned them down. And I was like, you know, so now I'm just kind of stuck at home. And luckily I met a guy and he was like, build your own gym. So I did that, Donnie Thompson out of South Carolina. He's a former powerlifting oh, yeah. champ. Uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 so I went, me and Roberto Garza went down there and met him. And one night he was like, build your own gym. It's the greatest thing in the world. So he, so that happened. So I, I spent a lot of time at my gym. And then um, Mitch Rosen, the head of CBS Radio, Doug Buffone, absolute legend in the radio business here. It was a post-game show. He tragically passed away. And they, Mitch asked him if he could speak to me. And I didn't do, you know, if you follow my career when I played, I didn't do much radio I didn't do much TV right. and I didn't really have a 
thought process of doing any of that stuff. And so he asked me if I wanted to do the post game show. And my first answer was no, I'm not, you know, I don't do radio and stuff. So I said, I say, Mitch, man, I go, I go, how did you get to me? Like, how did you get to like, Oh, you want Olin to do the post? I don't do anything. He said, well, Olin, uh, we're in the opinion business and everybody knows you fucking got them. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, I said, that's true. This, this, I can't argue. He, so, uh, so got into like radio and, and started to like it and TV and just kind of settled into like coaching my kids football when they were younger and running my gym and, 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 um, kind of just learning about your body and, and training and how I can stay strong and healthy. And, and, and I just keep learning from people and, you know, talking right now to a guy at Westside Barbell, John Quint is a soft tissue guy. He's, he's just for fun writing an O-line manual about training and strength. Wow. So just kind of on that journey, just having fun with it. What's your daily fitness routine? I go to the gym every day and I train, you know, I train and like right now I'm training with a few NFL guys. So, um, probably more strength now than I probably should be doing, but it's good for me mentally, you know? Yeah. So I work out, I do some, uh, once a week I'll do some boxing. Sometimes I do some jujitsu. Sometimes, and sometimes I just walk and wrestle and I play golf and I just, um, I just keep trying to change it up all the time. Can you still outlift your kids? Uh, it's not going to be long though, but yes, <laughs> it's not. <laughs> my 17 year old is going to catch me really soon. So oh, yeah, and, awesome. and I think he, I think he knows it. And, I was actually watching them, my 15-year-old and my 17-year-old, I was watching them punch in my gym yesterday. I have a guy who comes, and he trains all the kids and everybody. And I was thinking, man, if they jump me, I think they could take me right now. I hope they don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm carrying a taser for those two bastards. <laughs> oh, but they're not going to like it. I, I promise that much. They may I'll, kick I'll, your – I told them I'll catch them on the way in. Come on in. <laughs> First guy is going to get it. <laughs> oh, I like that. Oh. Uh, uh, last couple, what motivates you now that the, the paychecks aren't as big as they used to be and the crowds aren't there? I, I know, Nick, I just like to learn, man. I just, I just, I just like to learn new things and it, it kind of, uh, help helping people, helping young linemen train. And, and, and when you, when they look like they've, they've got a new skill that kind of motivates me to, to get up in the morning and just learn new things and, and, and help my kids grow and just, um, just just I like to like take what I learned from football and, and like to keep trying to prove that, that that is successful no matter what I'm doing. So I take my center, what I learned at being center where like you did when I watched you play a lot, uh, you study the film, you see all the cracks, you see, you see all your edge, you see the blitz coming. So you just study for hours. It's what I do in radio. It's what I do in TV. I study content for hours and just try to take that. And for me, that keeps me going. Love it. If you had a motto, what would it be? Uh, man, I, I don't know. I've never really lived by a motto. Um, I, I guess my motto would be there's really no substitute for persistence. Love that. Right on. Isn't that the truth, though? And it kind of comes back to what it's what you said at the beginning. It's like things have, for you, taken a little bit longer than maybe you would have liked them to, but you stuck with it, and they ended up working out just fine. I always do. Like us all, all us small centers know, we just keep chomping at the bit, man. Keep biting that nose guard's ankle. He'll go down eventually. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. At the beginning of <laughs> Oh, he doesn't even move. The first time you hit him in the first quarter, he ain't going fucking anywhere. He ain't going anywhere. I just keep hitting that son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the truth? First quarter, nothing. Second quarter, a little bit more. And I'm going to keep running circles around you. I'm going to show you that I'm not tired, even though you're wearing me down a little bit, but I'm wearing you down more. And then by the fourth quarter, I'm going to have broken your will, hopefully. Oh, man. I, 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 I used to always tell people, like, my game is like asking the pretty girl out. If she don't say no, you got a chance. Keep asking her. <laughs> <laughs> I wear her out. <laughs> oh, I that's love that it. That nose guard. He may say no to he, as long as he doesn't say no, I'm gonna keep hitting. Him. Oh, that's <laughs> great. Hey, Owen, thanks so much for this. This has been fantastic. Where can people follow you? Um, on Twitter or on Instagram or either, either or. Where? Tell them. Tell us about your gym. Tell know. us. Oh, well, the gym. I just I have it under Owen Cruz. It's under, it's under my Instagram. It's not. It's just sure. a private gym, so I don't. I don't really open it to the public, but um, nice. the, the ones you gave in the beginning was where they could follow me. Gotcha, buddy. Olin, thanks so much. What a pleasure, bro. Appreciate it, man. It was fun. Yeah, thank you. Stay in touch, please. Will do. All right, later.
All right, gang, that's all we've got for this episode of the Finding Center podcast. I hope you enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed doing it. One thing that would really help both of us and other potential new listeners is for you to rate this show and leave a comment in iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeart, or wherever you listen. Also, make sure to link up with us on social media. I'm at Finding Center Podcast and at Nick Hardwick. And follow, be sure to do this, at hardwick.life for great health information, recipes, and healthy lifestyle tips. And please share, share, share this podcast with anyone who you think might enjoy. I like to send specific episodes to people that I keep in mind while doing the podcast. Maybe you could do the same thing while you're listening. Thanks again, guys. Until next time, here's all the health to you.